All right, guys, so I apologize for the viewing angle on this. I don't have a really good way to do a kind of a top-down uh, way to measure or way to film this. So we're going to do the best we can. Hopefully you'll get the gist of what I'm talking about here on drop and drafting in open spaces. So you've got this large open area. It's curved. It's in a weird spot. And, you know, taking apart like the shoulder harness attachment here and orienting it so that it's square to the edge of the material or what you would normally think of in a proper orientation on the material is actually going to waste material. So I'm going to just kind of fit it in this open curved area as best I can. And quite simply, I'm just going to make a just a basic reference line just randomly in here. We'll call that one good there. And then I'm going to go ahead and make some perpendicular lines to that using the triangle method. So if you can see, I uh, used the 30, 30, 60, 90 triangle. And leaving that in place, I've laid the 45 down along the uh, angle side of it. And now I'm just going to move that 90 degree edge up and start making just a few reference lines here. These aren't in any particular location. So now what I've got is essentially the start of a perfect rectangle or a perfect square. So we know that those two lines there are perfectly 90 degrees to the main, the main reference line. And so I'm going to take this line here on the shoulder harness attachment, which is 75 millimeters long, and I'm going to make that this line. And I actually made my two reference lines 77 millimeters apart, which is, I think, kind of funny. But So what I'm going to do is just uh, go ahead and mark that at 75 millimeters. So we'll put a hash mark at 75. And that gives me the start of the upsweep towards where the rounded edge is. So now I can simply take, since I've made, we've used this as our kind of zero point. I'm actually going to draw this inverted. But we can take and measure our hash mark at 25 millimeters along this line right there. I'm going to extend that line up just a little bit. And I apologize if I keep bumping the camera. I'm trying to avoid doing that, but this is a weird angle to try and draw, draw at. <laughs> All right, so there's my 25 by 75 and now I need another reference mark at 127 and one at 147. So that's actually going to intrude upon this uh, part over here, but that's okay. So what we're going to do is make and draw this line a little bit longer and uh, just extend it out a little bit. Again, we know the part will fit, so this is simply just a, re uh, a re reference line. I'm going to go ahead and measure my bend line out at 127, and then locate my radius. So what I did was extended this line out. My original reference line was right about here. I just extended it into this part over here to give me a, a square point of reference. And I measured the 127 millimeter I need for the bend line. And I'm going to go out to 147 that I need to locate the center of the radius for that part. And now I'm going to do the same thing I did before, where I just draw some perpendicular lines. And you can, you can flip the triangles around however you want to accommodate however you need to draw it. So I'm going to line that up on that reference line, slide my triangles up draw my radius locator and my bend line. And I'll need to kind of make sure I realize that's a bend line. So now I need a line 49 millimeters up along where that radius location is. I'm sorry about the glare. So at 49 millimeters up, that's where the radius begins. So we know again that this line is perfectly perpendicular, which is how we need to locate by coordinate and stacking measurements. <clears throat> and what I'm going to do is 
draw another line to make that a crosshair. So again, lining back up on our original reference line, I want to draw a line perpendicular to that. So that I can make a crosshair here. So now I've got, I'm going to extend that one as well, make it a little bit more visible. So now this is the crosshair for my, where my circle template is going to go. Now I actually have drafting circle templates here, you can see. I have these. This is my metric large square or large circle metric one. It's way off. I actually started drafting parts early on and things weren't coming out exactly like I thought they should. And I found out that these circles are most likely um, SAE measurements that they just printed metric measurements on. So this circle template is largely junk if you actually need precise measurements. My standard circle template, however, here in inch measurements is perfect. And, the, and it's got metric equivalents on it, so you can get pretty darn close with the metrics. But I don't have anything that gives me exactly 20 millimeters. So I've made an actual circle template out of that cardboard that I like so much, that heavy cardboard. This is a 20 millimeter twenty millimeter radius slash forty millimeter diameter circle template and because I've drawn crosshairs on that now I can locate this template exactly where it needs to be with those reference lines that go through the center and now I can draw all the way around it and I've got a forty millimeter diameter circle I got a little bit of ink bleed there but that's okay so that gives me where I need to locate these parts and then quite simply, or that, that locates the end of the radius, and then quite simply you just draw lines tangent to the circle and your reference marks, like so, I remember this line here it was just a reference line that I drew, the actual measurement is where that hash mark is, and I'm going to draw from that hash mark tangent to the circle there. And so that's given me my overall part. And we've got a so it's upside down to the drawing here. You can see it's upside down to that drawing, but we've got our 40 millimeter circle, our 25 millimeter height here, 75 millimeter length here until we get to where it curves up, and then here's our bend line. So I'm going to go ahead and just write bend line right on there. And we've got our part. And you can see we've maximized quite a bit of the space inside the center of that curvature. Now I'll just have to cut this out on the bandsaw. Once I get this larger part cut, cut I can cut this out with a bandsaw or the jigsaw or however I want to do it. And we've maximized the amount of material we're using. And so we don't have just this big open space that's not going to be used. So I'm going to go ahead and draw these other ones out and you can see I've got my rudder hinge uh, plates in here that I've located in some extra space and everything else. So we're getting down to the wire on these actual parts and I put a little dot on my checklist indicating the parts that I've actually laid out. So that is the shoulder harness attachment and we'll call that the left one for now. And what I'll do is draw a mirror image of that so that I locate the bend lines on the proper side and I'll fill that dot in and then all I've got left in this uh, are in this thickness are the lower seat belt attachments, the mixer bearing support, the end plate gussets, and the end plate angle for the controls. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine more parts to make in this thickness. I've got the bottom skin gussets to do and those are pretty small. So only nine more parts to lay out in this thickness and then cut out and finish. So I obviously have tons of material left over. I, I will have tons of material left over, which is a good thing in case I need to remake a few parts here and there. The only ones I'm worried about are the, the channels, these big channels, because these are parts that are really hard to make. They have a, some pretty complex geometry and bend angles to them. Uh, the flat parts are going to be no problem. These simple rudder hinge plates are going to be no problem. 
uh, but these top channels which eat up a ton of material are going to be the ones that kind of cause me worry. All right so I wanted to give you a, just a quick final look at these uh, kind of randomly located parts here. So we talked about the one shoulder harness attach point that just kind of randomly fell into there. I did the same thing with the lower seat belt attach, the other shoulder harness attach, the other lower seat belt attach, and one of the bottom skin gussets. So that's a kind of a mirror, or not a mirror image, but just a duplicate part of this thing up here. I just crammed it into the space in there using just a bare reference line, using the triangles to lay out my angles and everything, and that turned out pretty well. So what I'll do now is just take some acetone or some alcohol and take this uh, Sharpie marker off where all these intersecting lines are to make sure that I don't cut along those lines. I'll basically just kind of clear a border around these parts to give me a, a really good idea of where I need to cut with the saw. And then that'll be that. You can, uh, if I can fit them on the bandsaw, I will. Or I might uh, grab the uh, circular saw with a carbide bit. Just keep in mind, you'll want to put some, uh, particularly on the saws like the bandsaw or the, uh, if you use a jigsaw or a circular saw, put a layer of painter's tape down on the actual fence or the platform of each of those saws. Uh, sawing shouldn't generate nearly as much heat as sanding does on the belt sander, so painter's tape is okay to use in these cases where you're cu simply cutting out parts in order to protect the aluminum. But I've got every piece laid out on here uh, that I need to cut, and I have all of this area still available to make replacement parts if I need to. I have one other uh, little end plate angle that I have to draw. That's only 155 millimeters by like 55 millimeters, so I'm probably going to locate it over here along the end. But everything else, I mean all this real estate up in here, and keep in mind all the parts I've already made, I've already got all this real estate up here that I need uh, to make some replacement parts. And if I'm lucky, I might even be able to squeeze in one of these channels if I mess those up. So at any rate, that's uh, kind of nesting your parts ma the manual way, the the down and dirty way without using a CAD program and printouts and tracing templates. So um, that's what I found has worked best for me. Anyway, I hope those few tips give you an idea on how to quickly and easily lay out your parts manually while somewhat maximizing the amount of material you're using. Again, you can do this with a CAD program and a nesting program and it'll really maximize the amount of material you're using, but uh, I found this to be much faster. But Use whatever method works for you, but if you don't want to get into redrawing the whole airplane in a CAD program, you can certainly do it this way. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. That's all for this video. Be sure to like, comment, or subscribe, and let me know if you have any requests for future video content. As always, thanks for watching, and good luck with your projects.